last lab, we discovered that all matter in the universe can be classified as either pure substances or mixtures. We looked at the physical and chemical properties of elements and compounds, which are pure substances. In this lab, we will explore the physical and chemical properties of mixtures. As always, before beginning any experiment in the laboratory, be sure you are familiar with laboratory safety requirements. For a demonstration of basic lab safety rules, you can watch our video entitled Lab Safety. A mixture is a substance consisting of two or more components that do not chemically combine in definite proportions and can be separated by physical means. So, when trying to determine if a sample is a mixture, we must look for these properties. The sample must consist of two or more components that do not chemically combine in definite proportions. The components can be separated by physical means. Does this sample of gravel meet the criteria for a mixture? This sample contains stones of various shapes, sizes, and colors. We can see that there are more white stones than any other color. Since the components do not chemically combine in definite proportions, the sample meets the first criterion for a mixture. By picking out stones of each type and placing them in separate piles, we can easily separate the components of this sample. Since the components of our sample can be separated by physical means, the sample meets the second criterion for a mixture. Since the sample meets both criteria for a mixture, we can conclude that it is a mixture. Mixtures can be identified by their composition as either homogeneous or heterogeneous. A homogeneous mixture has a uniform composition throughout. The three types of homogeneous mixtures are alloys, gaseous mixtures, and solutions. An alloy is a homogeneous mixture of two metals or of a metal and a nonmetal. These objects are made of the alloy brass, which is a mixture of copper and zinc. Copper and zinc are melted and mixed together. The two molten metals evenly blend to form a homogeneous mixture. When the metals cool, the alloy exhibits properties of both metals. Steel is an alloy of iron and coal, which is a form of carbon and is non-metallic. Whenever two gases mix, they disperse evenly to form a homogeneous gaseous mixture. A common example of a homogeneous gaseous mixture is the air we breathe. It consists of a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide, and other gases. A solution is a homogeneous mixture that consists of one substance dissolved into another substance. The substance being dissolved is the solute. The substance into which the solute is being dissolved is the solvent. The particles of solute in a solution are extremely tiny, less than one nanometer in diameter. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter, or one times 10 to the negative ninth meters. To put the size of a solute particle into perspective, consider this. Approximately 100,000 solute particles could be laid side by side across one human hair. For this solution, we will pour 50 grams of sodium chloride, also known as table salt, into a beaker containing 300 milliliters of water. In this solution, the salt is the solute and the water is the solvent. When we add salt crystals to water, the crystals dissolve, but the salt and water do not chemically combine. The salt crystals are broken into microscopic particles that are distributed throughout the sample. If we had a microscope powerful enough to see individual molecules, 
we would be able to see the sodium and chloride ions dispersed among the molecules of water. If we add an additional 50 grams of sodium chloride to the solution, the additional crystals dissolve and disperse among the water molecules. Since the amount of one component of this solution is variable, these substances do not combine in definite proportions. Earlier, we said that the components of a mixture can be separated by physical means. But can we separate the components of this salt water by physical means? The components of the sample cannot be separated as easily as the components of the gravel mixture. However, they can be separated by physical means through a process called distillation, which we will show you later in this lab. We have been discussing homogeneous mixtures. Now let's talk about heterogeneous mixtures. A heterogeneous mixture does not have a uniform composition throughout. Heterogeneous mixtures can be grouped into three broad categories. Heterogeneous solids, colloids, and suspensions. A heterogeneous solid is a mixture of solid components that retain their individual identities and are easily distinguished from one another. Some examples of heterogeneous solids are a salad, a bowl of mixed nuts, a bowl of jelly beans, or the gravel we looked at earlier. In a heterogeneous solid, each component of the mixture is solid. The other two types of heterogeneous mixtures, colloids and suspensions, contain at least one component that is not a solid. A colloid is a heterogeneous mixture in which the particles of one substance are dispersed evenly throughout a second substance. In colloids, the substance in which the particles are dispersed is called the dispersion medium, and the particles being dispersed are called colloidal particles. Colloidal particles are between 1 and 1,000 nanometers in diameter. Let's see what happens when we mix starch and water. The colloidal particles are starch and the dispersion medium is water. The starch particles in the colloid are approximately 500 nanometers across. Milk is another common colloid. Milk consists of particles of liquid fat dispersed in a dispersion medium of water. Fog is a colloid made up of tiny droplets of water dispersed in air. Smoke is a colloid of carbon particles dispersed in air. One kind of colloid is formed by two liquids that do not ordinarily mix. Vegetable oil and water do not mix well because molecules of water and droplets of oil repel each other. Even if we vigorously shake the mixture, the oil separates from the water and the droplets float to the top of the water. To form a colloid with oil and water, we need an emulsifier. An emulsifier is a substance that keeps the components of a colloid from separating. An emulsifier is attracted to oil, so when it is added to the mixture, its molecules cling to the oil and surround the droplets. Molecules of the emulsifier and molecules of water are also attracted to each other, so the emulsifier surrounding the oil droplets causes the oil droplets to become suspended between water molecules. This allows two liquids that would not ordinarily mix to form a colloid. One common emulsifier is lecithin. Lecithin is a fatty substance found in soybeans, egg yolk, and other plant and animal cells. Let's see what happens when we add 10 grams of lecithin to the oil and water mixture and shake it again. Lecithin caused the oil and water to form a cloudy but stable colloid. Let's review just a moment. If the particles in a mixture are less than one nanometer in diameter, we call the mixture a solution. If the particles in a mixture are between one and 1,000 nanometers in diameter, then we call the mixture a colloid. What do we call the mixture if the particles are larger than 1,000 nanometers? 
If the particles in a mixture exceed 1,000 nanometers, the mixture is called a suspension, and the particles are called suspension particles. A suspension is a heterogeneous mixture composed of solid particles that are suspended in a liquid or a gas. Because the suspension particles are so large and so heavy, they are not dispersed evenly throughout the suspension medium. If we mix sand with water and stir the mixture, the particles of sand become temporarily suspended in the water. However, because suspension particles are heavier than the particles in a solution or colloid, they do not remain suspended. Some other examples of suspensions are an aerosol spray, peanut butter, and paint. If paint is not stirred, the suspension particles of pigment will settle to the bottom of the can. Now, let's compare solutions, colloids, and suspensions and look at an interesting phenomenon called the Tyndall effect. John Tyndall was the 19th century British physicist who first discovered this phenomenon. According to John Tyndall, when intense light passes through a colloid or a suspension, the beam of light becomes visible because the particles in the mixtures reflect the light. To show you this, we will use our three types of mixtures a salt water solution, a starch and water colloid, and a sand and water suspension. Look what happens when we shine the light through each of the three mixtures. The light passes through the solution largely unaffected and unseen because there are no particles to deflect it. However, we can clearly see the beam of light in the colloid and the suspension. This is because the particles in these mixtures deflect the light and make the beam visible. You may have seen the same phenomenon with the headlights of an automobile on a foggy night. The light from the headlights is scattered by the colloidal particles of water in the air. Or perhaps you have seen the rays of sunlight as they pass through the colloidal particles in the clouds. Earlier, we said that the components of a mixture can be separated by physical means. Let's look at this heterogeneous mixture of salt and pepper and demonstrate how to separate its components. With a magnifying glass and an extremely steady hand, we could pick out all the grains of pepper, but this would take a long, long time. We could speed up the process by using filtration. Filtration is the physical process of separating solid particles from a liquid or gas mixture by passing the mixture through a porous material, such as a filter or membrane. Since filtration separates solid particles from a liquid, you may be wondering how we will use filtration to separate salt from pepper, two solids. Because salt and pepper are both solid, we need to first add the mixture to water. Salt is soluble in water, but the pepper grains remain floating in the solution. However, we do see that a brown organic acid from the pepper has also dissolved in the water, giving the solution a brown color. Now, we pour the mixture through a piece of filter paper inside the funnel. The salt water solution passes through the filter but the grains of pepper are trapped in the filter. We have isolated the pepper, but now we have a salt water solution. How do we separate the salt from the water? To separate the components of a solution, we use the process we referenced earlier called distillation. Distillation is the physical process of separating a component from a solution by boiling and condensation. Distillation requires three parts. A boiling flask in which to boil the solvent, a condenser to cool the gaseous solvent, and a collection flask to collect the condensed solvent. The condenser consists of an inner tube and an outer tube. Steam from the boiling flask passes into the inner tube. Cool water circulates in and out of the outer tube. The cool water in the outer tube 
causes the steam to condense to a liquid again. The condensed water is collected in the collection flask. After the water is removed from the solution, the salt remains in the boiling flask. By using filtration, we separated the pepper from the original salt and pepper mixture. Then, by using distillation, we separated the salt from the solution. We have completely separated the components of the original mixture. In our next lab, we will explore the science of meteorology. At this time, you may proceed with the corresponding activities.